going to talk to you about a framework called Personal Knowledge Mastery. The framework I developed, but the inspiration for, for it came from what was called, or, and still is called, Personal Knowledge Management. PKM, as, a, as I call it, is a uh, framework that I developed over time that didn't really, it was like this little sideline, and because I blog and things like that that I talked about and I developed, it was how the heck can I, as a consultant, sell my services and stay current in my profession and not spend any money. But you think about it is that the more connected you are, the more connections you have, then the greater chances of chance coming along. If you talk to more people, if you get out to more places, if you connect with more people on social media, that your chances of actually uh, having something good happen increase. So, this is a question that uh, Robert Kelly at Carnegie Mellon University asked, and I'm asking you this question. What percentage of the knowledge that you need to do your job do you have in here? Are you dependent upon getting information from elsewhere or not? Information, knowledge from other people. My premise is that we don't have the knowledge that we need to do our jobs and the thing is, I mean, block it off for a day, for a week, for a month, for a year, or throughout our career, we need other ways of, being, uh, of, of getting access to knowledge, to up-to-date information. And that comes from our social networks, comes from our communities of practice. If we have a community of practice, if we're engaged in one, how do we connect with stuff outside, beyond us, so we can stay current, so we can stay up-to-date, so we can continuously push the frontiers of our capabilities as professionals. So we all live in social networks. We're all affected by social networks. Right? These, th these are connections to other human beings. How do we get ideas from as wide and diverse a social network as possible, but how do we still focus and get things done? So my supposition right, on this whole thing is, is that we have to do work. We need to get ideas. We need to make sense of these ideas and the stuff that we're doing at work. And that as knowledge workers, we need to be in all three of those places. We have one brain. So, th so, so you're dancing between these things, and knowledge work and creative work and getting ideas and getting stuff done and hopefully having a brilliant flash of, of, of insight you know, happens as things are flowing between these three. <laughs> Communities of practice are not something that somebody tells you to join. You have to self-identify. You have to want to go into them. Right? They change your practice, or else not really a community of practice. It, it's just maybe you know a bunch of people getting together for a beer on the weekend. And that doesn't quite count. Um, and the other thing is that they also have uh, they, they have lives. Communities of practice come and go. They're like living, breathing things. But I have to say is that communities of practice in my business, and I think in everybody's business who's in the knowledge business, become your lifeline. They become your social safety net. So start building your network, start building this, and that's what the practice of PKM helps people do. So social networks, they have a diversity of ideas and opinions. So part of it is that how do I make sure that I have a diverse social network? Our communities of practice are these safe, trusted places where we can, where we can talk, we, can, we, we have mixed ties. I don't personally know everybody in my, communities, my various communities of practice, but I know people who know them and they vouch for them, so I, so I still trust them. And the PKM model, so personal knowledge mastery, okay, at the very, very top layer of, of my model are three words. Seek, sense, share. Seek out information, seek out people, seek out new ideas. Sense, do something to make sense of them. You can't just sort of collect stuff and park it away. You actually have to do something with it. And then finally, share is that the example I give is that, uh, I mean, if you don't, if you are an expert, you have expertise, and you don't share what you know, and you don't share it in a way that people can understand it, what you're actually doing is you're making sure that your social networks, right, you owe it to make your network smarter. What PKM is like is that it's like breathing in and breathing out. So I breathe in through my, uh, through my networks, I filter I, I set up systems which I can filter uh, s uh, signal from noise, with the good stuff from the, from the fake news and things like that. And then I, I filter it through my communities. Again, like I mentioned, I talk to Valdis and I say, is this worth looking at? Right? I make sense of it either individually or while I'm working. I'm actually doing things. Right? Okay, uh, It could be something like writing a new report, coming up with a new concept, uh, doing something in a different way. Uh, all sorts of different things that you can do on that. And then now that you've created something new, then you breathe out back through your communities and back through your networks. So seek, sense, share. 
basically the, okay, you can, you can be a simple seeker. You can seek stuff out. You can find things and then you can broadly share it. You can seek and make sense for yourself and be a little, you know, uh, a little greedy. Or you can do all three. And if you're an expert who's locked up in his or her office, you're not helping your network. And you're also not going to get back from your network. So I say for the important stuff in your profession, in your life, what you're passionate about, is it really you want to be pushing towards becoming a knowledge catalyst. And the PKM workshops that I run, that's basically the role, is taking people from here and from there and helping them become catalysts. And in personal knowledge mastery, it's a big P for personal. There is no one way, there are no recipes, there's no certification. I've stayed away from certification because there's only one measure. The measure is, is that if it works for you, and then the other measure is if you're recognized by your peers. Um, so again, in 30 minutes, 35 minutes, I can only explain so much, but, but I think that the principles, because the principles are, are, are ground, there's a, there's a fair bit of research uh, on this, and I've tried to create a practical model that can be, and I've talked more again on the, uh, on the tech side, but I think but it has been used in non-tech ways. And people who take my workshop, I've, I think I've got people from about 50 different countries in the world. And so I've had people from uh, Tanzania uh, take it. So people who, you know, they're only able to log in uh, once a day or something like that. And, and they found it useful. Uh, I don't know how much and where. So, so I, again, I'm not trying to sort of dodge and say, yeah, this, this is, I mean, I joke about the universal theory of everything. Uh, but I think it's, pr it's a practical sense-making um, framework that might help you in, s in certain ways. And I mean, you can use Seek, Sense, Share, non-tech, right? What, do you s what are you learning new? What newspapers are you reading? You know, what, uh, who are you talking to? One way that I seek out diverse opin uh, uh, opinions is I take public transport on purpose. I don't go in the limo or the taxi or anything like that, all right? Because I want to bump into people and have those serendipitous things. So that's kind of a non-tech way. Does that answer? Okay. And I'm glad you like Canadians. I love South Africans. So. <laughs> this is my second favorite country. I, I, I'm happy in Canada. <laughs> yeah, yes, sir. It definitely applies. It's actually a core part of it. So some of the other work that I do is on um, the changing nature of work. And so with the changing nature of work, uh, robots, AI, software are chewing up uh, what was traditionally seen as what I call labor. So that was uh, diligent work, uh, analytical work, and things like that. And that means that uh, the place for human work is in more creative work. We're talking about innovation and creativity. Well, we can't be creative unless we're connected to people. There's been uh, great research done on uh, uh, when um, uh, Tasmania separated from the mainland of, uh, of Australia. Uh, the, uh, the indigenous people who were there were, uh, were sort of where they were set adrift, basically. But their numbers weren't large enough. And they actually regressed as a civilization. They lost a lot of their knowledge because they weren't able to connect to enough people. So we know that being connecting to diverse social networks actually it was important for Aboriginals tens of thousands of years ago, and the same for us. So our future is not being better than machines or the robots, but it's being better humans. And I think that this is one, uh, one way of looking at how am I better human by, I mean, the more diverse opinions you get, the more diverse people y you get and things like that, the more open you become. Um, Hopefully, the more liberal, the more progressive, the you know, and the least, the, the less likely to think of people as the other. So, uh, so yeah, yes, I, and actually, if you just go to my blog and just uh, uh, just search automation, I've got a number of uh, of things about that. But yeah, I mean, automate. That's the problem. Is that is it? A lot of our schools and our education, our programs are just trying to make us better uh, machines, you know. But we're never going to be better machines. I mean, they beat us at brute force. They're going to beat us in brute analysis. And so what have we got left? We've got passion. We've got humor. You know, we, we, uh, we have creativity. I mean, those are, those are those human things. And it's by being connected to, to more humans and, and, and uh, diverse groups of humans, I think we can do it better. That's, uh, I, uh, does that answer it? Or you good? Oh, and there was a question down here? Sir? Yeah.
Yes. Did you mean as if they are not, they don't feature in the battle, or they don't buy the competitive? What I'm saying is that there are people for th where this model doesn't, uh, it's, it's completely outside of their, 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 their own reality. Is that why would anybody need to do this kind of stuff? Because I'm looked after, <laughs> you know. Um, that, that, that's, that's ba because, and that's one reason that the whole notion of PKM and those kinds of skills are hard to sell. The other way it's hard to sell in corporations is that uh, uh, quite often they say, well, if these people have these networks outside, they might leave, right? And so it becomes a thing, well, th we want to keep them inside and only focused on their job, right? I mean, you, you do it. I mean, you go on Twitter at work, let's say, and they'll say you're not doing your job. Or you put your feet up and read a book while you're at your desk. That's not your job, you know, quite often. And some jobs, I mean, it is. I mean, for me, sitting down and reading a book is my job. So, uh, um, so, so again, it's the, the, the HSP thing was just to show that it's not, it, it's not a sort of like a done deal in terms of selling the whole notion of PKM and why it's important. Yeah. Beyond just blogging, how, how, how do you create these communities of practice? Because I think most people would have those work teams and most people would have social networks. But how do you create, especially in new spaces, how do you create uh, those um, communities of practice? Um, the, the, the first way to um, create a, well, the, fir the, not the first way to create one, the first thing to do is to identify any existing communities of practice because a lot of times they exist, right? And it might be a group of people who get together every Friday to talk about things, uh, something pr particular. And we get groups like that. A friend of mine, Silin Schillinger, started one up about w women's issues at uh, Sanofi Pasteur, right? Mm -hmm. Completely unofficial that she did. And uh, if you tweet me or send me a note, I can give you the stuff on Silin. She's very active on, on Twitter. Um, she's won several awards in France for uh, Woman of the Year for IT and tr uh, transformation, things like that. She basically helped change the company, break the glass ceiling uh, for women uh, on that. And it started off with a bunch of women having lunch together on Fridays, not on company time. Uh, so, uh, so it wasn't official. Right? Um, and, then she, and then she later uh, led the creation of a worldwide community of practice, which is uh, to... Um, uh, to stamp out dengue fever because there's no money in it. Nobody, nobody, the big pharma doesn't want to invest in dengue fever because it's only poor people who get it, so who cares? And started this grassroots community of practice to, uh, to, uh, to address that. Um, so identify things that are already there. If you have a great urge to be, uh, how come there's no community of practice for my particular field? Start one. Where are you going to go? Well, doesn't have to be a blog. I don't use blog. We, so I have, I have three communities of practice that I'm really active in. And they're all, we're all geographically, geographically uh, dispersed because, again, I live in the middle of nowhere. So a small one that's four people, and we use Skype to, uh, to connect with each other, because so, Canada, UK, and the US. And then there's another one that's got about 10 or 15 people, and that's uh, Canada, UK, France, Spain, uh, Latvia, a couple of other places, we've got these folks, and we talk about different types of issues. And there's another one that's a little bit bigger, and it's run out of Australia, but it also has North Americans and Europeans in it, and a mix of freelancers and people working inside companies. Each one of those has a different focus, but I identify with each one of those. And what I've learned from each one of those is, I, I mean, I, I, mean that's a, I would never give up my communities because I just learned so much, that's my that's where I learn. That's where I can have deep conversations with people, right, which you can't do on Twitter that easily with people you don't know. So it's that safe, trusted space. If you don't have one of those and you're a knowledge professional, find one. I think the community of practice, because I'm in the technology space, works much more easier, you know. Uh, we tend to collaborate uh, quite a lot, especially when one starts moving into a strategic position in a technology firm. Uh, you need to have, in a way, uh, be almost a subject matter expert in a various in in, in a number of uh, domains mm -hmm. you know you might be talking architecture you might be talking uh, uh, strategy in terms of how do you enable business to do what it needs to do or whether you would need to use a number of uh, techniques to facilitate the discussion whether it's around risk management or mm -hmm. anything of that sort so i think tapping in those into those community of practices uh, allows you to ask those questions, test the waters just before you have those discussions with the business leaders because sometimes you need to tailor make your discussion 
you know, uh, which is in, in a way that is more relevant for the type of audience that you deal with. So in a way, yeah, I think it works in the technology space. But then my question is around uh, quite often when uh, new recruits come in, especially those that uh, only have a few years experience, they would want to graduate to higher levels, but yet they don't have the expertise uh, to, you know, to straddle those realms. So how would you advise them in a way uh, to be able to scale up in terms of knowledge uh, by using, utilizing those uh, communities of practices? Yeah, I think that you, it's, it's a few things, is that I think in the workplace is that you should have some kind of mentoring uh, or what, uh, uh, there's a, a field called cognitive apprent apprenticeship. Um, and I think that that would be, that, so there's a responsibility in the workplace to do that. I think in the communities of practice, uh, if you want to be a dynamic community of practice, you want to invite members in who are junior, who are senior, who have different experience. And, and, and a lot of that is the members themselves, and sometimes there may be a manager within the community. And they're the ones saying, you know what, guys, you're all talking about guy stuff here. You know, we've got to talk about something a little bit different. And so, you get pe so that becomes the culture uh, of that. So, so if you're a senior person, I would say that you should be looking at how can I help out the junior, the junior people. It's like if you're an expert, why you're not sharing, right? So the same thing with it, and same thing within that community. If you're an expert, why, why, why are you not sharing? So I think that you can sort of put the, and you can even make some of those things, um, uh, you can articulate them. You can say, okay, in this community, this is what happens. Like in the ones, I, most of the ones I'm in, it's, uh, it's a written rule, it's not even unwritten, is that what is said here is not shared without the permission of the people who are saying it, right? And that's just, that's it, you, with this, what's, it stays inside. So, and you may have different types of rules. So a, a, a community is like a living, breathing thing. And if you don't, if you're not active, if you don't nurture it, you know, it's, it's going to go away. So it, the question becomes, is this important to you? Um, and is this something that, that, that you believe in, so you have to put some effort into it? And I think that, again, so if you're a senior person, you wanna be, you know, when we talk to other senior people saying, you know what? We don't have enough junior people in here. We're not, what are we doing to help the, the, the younger people out? And maybe we need to do something. We need to uh, invite them in. And also, you know, when it comes time, have a funeral and shut down the community if it no longer serves a purpose. Don't keep flogging it forever, I think. Does that sort of cover a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Yes? I I have a question about a couple of, of the linkages that you mentioned. So from the social networks, you talked about seeking new knowledge, yes. but filtering. Yes. And similarly, um, at taking action, you talked about discernment. I wonder if you could say a bit more about those two. What kind of tools would you use to filter okay. and tools to discern? Yeah. There's all kinds of tools. The, 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 there's more tools than anything. A, a, a friend of mine, uh, Jane Hart, uh, she has a website, uh, uh, Hart, H-A-R-T. If you Google her, you'll probably find her. Uh, she, has a, she, she does a yearly survey of thousands of people around the world, and she asks them, what tools do you use for learning and professional development? Right. And then they rank them. And uh, Jane just finished her 10th annual uh, survey last year, and, and she put the top 200 tools there. Right. And so, so in terms of tools, there's no shortage, and people use different things for different reasons. And, and so a tool may be better for cognitive load, uh, offsetting the cognitive load. A tool may be better for sharing. Uh, again, your mileage may, may vary. But you know, sort of, and there, there are heuristics, general rules of thumb, on you saying, who do you seek? Right? So um, in, if it's an area of, 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 of importance to you, all right, so you are, let, uh, you are a, uh, uh, a psychologist, all right, then you want to be connected to a, a broad range of psychologists, right? Because, these, because you, you want to be current on what's going on, right? And so you may be connected through Twitter and Facebook and personal and uh, attending sessions like this. This is all part of, the, uh, part of getting that diversity of opinion. Um, but there's other stuff that you're only, you know, sort of interested in. And in that case is that one or two sources of kind of like experts or whatever, maybe the economist for uh, economic stuff is enough for you. You just subscribe to the economist and that's good enough. So it's, that f it's up to you how you fil filter signal from noise. Um, in the workshops, what we do, one of the things is that I say, okay, I want you to go out and I, you choose an area and then I want you to find 20 people who talk about that. And I want you to follow them and just read and not say anything. And now two weeks from now, I want you to take a look and, and say, okay, are these people 
you know, are they signal or are they noise? And can we filter them through? But at the same time, you also don't want to create filter bubbles, right? So that, uh, you know, I'm relatively liberal, relatively progressive. I still connect to some right wing kind of folks there because I want to know what's going on because I, I, want, to, I want to know what's important to them. I want to, know what's I want to know what they're talking about, what's important to them. So I think we, so we have to have, I, I think it's important to have dissenting opinions. And then also, um, I take a look at it from a geographical perspective. I don't want to only have people in North America, you know, so I look at people from other countries, different perspectives, young and old. As I get older, I try to connect to more and more younger people. Now that my sons have left home, I no longer have a little petri dish to sort of figure out what's going on with young people. Yes? Hi. Um, how would you know when your community of practice is now a, an echo chamber? Like, what, what would you see? What would it look like? I think you, uh, how do you know if your community of practice is an echo chamber? Uh, I, again, is it, humans are really good at pattern recognition. We're also good at self-delusion. Um, so I think it's by asking critical questions. And that's where community managers are really good. So you ha if you actually have somebody who has the role of community manager, they can say, you know what, this is getting just a little too focused on this one area, and we're missing out on a whole bunch of other things. What well, I think as professionals uh, is that it, one way would be to ask that on a regular basis every year, okay? What are the different things we're talking about? How diverse is it? What are we missing? What new area or what new person should we be looking at to bring in here? Should we be looking at bringing in young people? Should we be looking at bringing in people from a different community? Uh, and so I think it's just really, it's, it, again, it's, it, it's, like, it's like a family, right? It just thing sort of keeps moving, morphing, things change. It has slow periods, peak periods, and things like that. So the model and the framework is for people to, to again, to help make sense of it. I, now, I've used this inside organizations where they're looking at having digitally savvy um, uh, uh, employees. Uh, just finished a two-year project with Carlsberg Breweries where, we, where, where the PKM framework was part of the social learning component of the leadership program, and the program was a year long. Um, again, this is not inside the organization. Uh, okay, this is inside for sure. That's outside mostly, and this is inside and or outside and or both, right? I, so, uh, so there are internal communities of practice, they're external and there's some that are both. Procter & Gamble has a number of uh, uh, supplier um, and then uh, consumer researcher inside uh, ones. They've really done a lot of work uh, with communities of practice. So, uh, so the thing is that, I mean, the big thing about communities of practice is that you have to self-identify, you have to want to be a member of them uh, if it's a real community. So if your boss says you have to join that community of practice, it's not really a community of practice. So you can't really put them into organization. You can, but you can put in systems in place. I mean, like the, you know, the old Google 20% uh, rule. You can spend 20% on another project. Well, what's wrong with you can spend 10% of your time uh, finding, engaging, and uh, uh, with the communities of practice that perhaps aren't inside the organization. So that would be something that, that, that fit in that. Um, but what we have found is that, you know, if you have people who are actively practicing something, some version of PKM, and again, there, there are thousands of versions. Um, if you go on my website uh, uh, and you look for PKM routine, I think I've got like 20 of them. Every people who share their routine with me, you can see that everybody's is different, right? So if you have people doing that, and then you have teams that are actively sharing what they're doing, working out loud, as they call it, right? And then, then the organization itself can curate what's coming out of that, uh, of those things. So if people aren't working out loud, if people aren't actively engaged with outside the company, then the only stuff we're going to get is inside knowledge. So, but, but because I, my brain can be in all three of those, I can then talk about stuff inside the company from what I learned outside and become, it's basically competitive intelligence. And the PKM routine actually is, uh, is almost aligned with the, with the CI process, the competitive intelligence. I worked in military intelligence for a while. I remember looking at it and think, yeah, this is just like, you know, the collate, collect, disseminate uh, 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 routine that, that, that we had in military intelligence. So, uh, so, so again, the, the problem is, is that it, this is not an implementable program. It's a way in which you can help and you can enable people. And because it's kind of fuzzy that way, it's a hard sell. Yeah, to the HSPs. <laughs> did, did that cover it, sort of? Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, yep, in the back. Um, in, in the future, these technology companies, do you see them working well globally, as in maybe even being formed virtually across the world, instead of just uh, people being based in a, like a bricks and mortar company? 
So also just on that question, if there are people uh, geographically based around the world, if there's just one person in where, wherever, China or, or America, um, do they still work well in a team like that, a virtual team, or do, do they become uh, isolated, or is the technology enough, you know, face to face on Skype enough to? Okay, so you, you're talking. So can distributed teams or distributed companies work? So, so I would think that something like this would, would like the PKM framework, would help because what you're doing is you're getting people to articulate what quite often is inside their brain, right? And when you're distributed, then you can't. You can't T look at each other, I can't raise my eyebrows or something like that, that helps. But there are companies that do, that, that do this, Automatic, which is the company that uh, uh, builds the Word <laughs> WordPress software, right? Automatic is 100% distributed. Uh, they have no office, they actually shut down their only office space because no one would go there. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and they have some interesting uh, processes in place in how they do that and they use, again, they use WordPress internally they, um, and, and people work out loud and they share and they do stuff and it seems to work quite well. They've been, they've been doing it okay. But again, you know, there's a difference between creating a new co company culture and taking an existing company culture and, try and, and trying to change it. But, I mean, but, but we are seeing that I mean, there is a changing nature in work. Again, I mean, if I, if I was not able to self-publish, Right, starting you know, uh, 14, 15 years ago, I would not be doing what I'm doing. So th just the ability to self-publish to the web and other people could read it has fundamentally changed a lot of businesses and a lot of work, I mean, at least private consulting, for sure. Uh, yes? Just a question on this, you know, in terms of the correlation between your model and what's happening in terms of the innovation space, where there's a lot of crowdsourced ideas, yeah. et cetera, filter that through, they have a panel, they have a process that they go through, and then they have a team that'll execute on new yeah. idea. How do you see parallels between your model and the existing platforms yeah. and technologies that are being used to harvest right. innovative change? So, so if you ask me that question online, I would send you a link to my blog post on PKM and innovation. Okay, because I, I have written on it. So actually, if you go to my blogging, find But basically, innovation, it's interesting here. It's there's, um, I, I, I can't remember the source, it's on my blog, right? But uh, they were looking at different types of, in, uh, of innovation. And they found that it was out here in these loose areas that we got this exponential, uh, that's not quite the, the, the word, but we got big innovation, big new ideas came in here. Down in here, we got incremental innovation, like making things better, refining it. Now we need both, right? But, you know, if we're only, working down here, if we're only inside the firewall, if we're only inside the organization, all we're going to get is incremental innovation. And um, uh, there's a um, uh, little black book of innovation. Has anybody read that one? Um, anyway, in the little black book of innovation, there are four steps that they talk about. And you look at seek, sent, share. Um, the four steps are the first one aligns with seek, the next two with sense, and then the last one with share. And, and this is what the Mitch Joel, I think, was the author of that. Again, go on my blog and PKM Innovation, uh, and, and, and you'll find it. Um, and so, so yeah, it is, it, it is aligned. Is that you know the, the, the where good ideas come from? Because that's really what uh, uh, Johnson was talking about. Good ideas, and, and, and he did his research is pretty extensive, going back uh, hundreds of years about why did this happen, and it and it is about there's a mix between diversity and you have enough people bumping into each other, right? But also that there are people who are able to focus deeply on things and you need to have both. And I think that for knowledge work and creativity and innovation, we need to find ways in which we can be doing those types of things. You know, I mean, like I know like when I'm writing or something like that is that I'm focused, I'm in my room, I just do it on, on, on my own. But where I get interesting ideas and I you know, notebook or take pictures is out there and get, at getting different stuff. So I think uh, doing that, having, Encouraging in it, uh, uh, w people to get out, encouraging, and, and you can you can put uh, uh, these things into place. Uh, National Research Council in Canada, in one of their offices, they have compulsory coffee break once a week or once a month, and everybody has to go. That's an order, and it's a big room like this, and they have really good sticky buns and food and coffee and tea and stuff like that. And there's no agenda, but you have to be there, and the whole place is covered in whiteboards. And there's cameras and there's other things and, and, and crayons and markers and stuff like that. And it's amazing that you get two people from two completely different areas who finally wind up, who are talking to each other. Next thing you know, they're on the whiteboard writing stuff out. It's all, so we're not telling you to innovate, but we're making the opportunity, right, that maybe something will happen in this space. So I think those are the kinds of things that we can engineer.
it's just like engineering space so the students meet each other from different departments, that kind of stuff.